Mayor, thanks so much for being here. It's great to have you. Thanks so much, and thanks everyone for having me. Yeah, it's great to have this audience out here live. I want to kick the conversation off with your outlook for the economy. It's been more resilient than many folks would think. Do you think it could last? Well, I have never been one to say that we would go into a recession in 2023, and I don't think we're going to go into a recession in 2024, and here's why. Um, I divide the economy into two sectors. Um, those uh, under 38 years old, I call them the avocado toast generation. So that's Gen Z and the lower uh, cohort of um, the millennials. Um, they have jobs, they're employed, but so they have money, they have income, but they don't have wealth, they don't own homes. And then you have 38 and above, which are the homeowners. And so. What's staggering is um, uh, the 38 and below are ha own less in terms of U.S. real estate than they've ever owned before, and um, those over 50, over 70 percent of U.S. housing is owned by those over 50. So if you've owned a home for the last 10 years. Um, you've made $21, million, $21 trillion in equity. So you're sitting on, so when we went into the housing crisis, um, equity levels were very low. Mm -hmm. So equity levels were in the 40% range um, in terms of uh, to loan, to, uh, loan to value, um, uh, and or equity to, to value. And today, that's gone up, up over 70%. So Americans are sitting on a tremendous amount of equity in their homes. It's a question of when they tap into it. And I think that um, you do not see credit card debt rising as fast as you would think it was. It's rising at about 24% of total spend, uh, consumer spending over the last 10 years. Um, the U.S. consumer is delevered dramatically. So at, like I said, 70% equity in homes, they can tap that at any point. Home equity lines of credit, which you would think they would tap, haven't been touched. They're actually lower than they were last year. Fed Chair Powell last week left the prospect of further interest rate hikes on the table. Uh, we heard this morning from Neil Kashkari, the Minneapolis Fed voter, uh, saying that he would rather over tighten. If we were to see rates move higher from where they are right now, does that change your forecast at all? Or on the flip side, to your point on home equity, the fact that homeowners are now sitting on fixed rate mortgages of 5% or lower, 80% of Americans, I should say, are sitting on fixed rate mortgages of 5% or lower, does that make the economy uh, more immune, perhaps? to the Fed's blunt interest rate tool? Surely it's going to have an impact, but it has the most direct impact on asset prices. And so I think if you look at the housing market today, um, and I think this is so critical with the U.S. consumer, which drives two-thirds of the U.S. economy, uh, you see home prices that are roughly at, at 20, 21, 20, 20, 21, 22 levels, maybe a little bit higher reflective of a very different interest rate environment. So when you have interest rates go higher, home values have to go lower. And I think something else is going, so that's just net, that's just math. Mm -hmm. So I think something else is going to happen too. So when I say that um, over 70% of homes are owned by people over 50, um, AARP estimates, and this is a long-term estimate um, of multi-decade, that 51% of people over 50 downsize to smaller homes. Um, that's over 30 million units of housing. And it's, uh, I think it's rate agnostic because older people have lower mortgages, if any mortgage at all. Last year, uh, you had record uh, ho all cash deals in terms of home, um, home purchases. So in Naples, 58% of the homes that were transacted were all cash. So I think what happens is you have high levels of, of equity. Um, when people want to sell, they will reduce their home prices and sell. That means the sooner you sell, the more you, the, the, the higher probability that you lock in the paper equity gains that you have. The later you sell, there's going to be what today there is a uh, demand supply uh, imbalance where there's too much demand, not enough su supply. That's going to invert um, as boomers, more and more boomers, start to sell and downsize, or over 50 start to, to downsize, and that's the vast, vast majority of, of homes that will come on the market, then you'll see a supply-demand dynamic uh, shift. Now, 
because what, so what's going to drive homes? that? Because as I just mentioned, 80% of Americans sitting on fixed rate mortgages of 5% or less, you're saying all, they bought all cash, they don't have mortgages right now, but no, no, mortgage rates right now is, are prevailing at 8%. So what's the incentive? Sorry, sorry. What I'm saying is that the cash, that the deals last year that were done um, had the highest cash components um, in over 10 years. Um, today, if you look at the homeowners, 66% of homeowners, the older cohorts don't have much of a mortgage at all. They're sitting on so much equity. So when they sell a larger house and take out their equity, cash in their equity, they're going to be buying a smaller house, likely for all cash. The risk here is um, the ability of the buyer, the younger buyer, to buy from the boomer. And that's why I say prices have got to come down to be commensurate with rates. And there, there's a mismatch here now. So when do you see this playing out? I think What's it starts to happen in 24. And when do you see the reversal of more supply on the market? Because I think it's 24, 24 into, late 24 into 25. And it's a multi-decade cycle. Because um, the peak of existing home sales was around 7 million in 2005 at the peak of the housing um, uh, market. And today, I think it's, or next year, it's estimated, Goldman Sachs estimates that they think it's going to be 3.8. I think it's going to be higher than that, for sure. Um, you've got. Uh, upwards of, let's say, 30, let's say it's 20. Let's, uh, has, it's a pig through the python. So um, I think that's going to be a multi-year um, multi stage. So the, what I call the silver tsunami is um, over the next five years, the last of the baby boomers turn 65. Mm -hmm. And that'll be, a, that'll be a, 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 another tailwind to this trend. All right, switching gears. I know you cover the banks. How are the bank's balance sheets now? Have they been doing the hard work to bolster their balance sheets as interest rates have gone up so that we won't see a repeat of the regional bank failures that we saw earlier this spring? Well, I think the regional bank failures um, were specific to interest um, rate mismanagement, asset li liability ma management, and um, another issue where, I mean, uh, Silicon Valley was hiding in plain sight. I, everything, I mean, there was no secret to it. Going into the fourth quarter, there was no secret to what was on their balance sheet. Um, and I think that what caused the demise of Silicon Valley was something that I call a faith-based um, run on the bank. So the US, any, any financial market is a faith-based system. And when investors lose faith, the, you know, the institution doesn't survive. So, Bank balance sheets today are, and this is important too, because if you look at the biggest banks that used to be the biggest consumer lenders, all of those that have been under higher capital standards have basically uh, ceded their involvement in consumer lending to non-bank players. And so more of the activity has moved off bank balance sheets. Now the new 16 banks that are ring-fenced in terms of the over 100 billion in assets um, that are uh, uh, will have higher capital standards. You're going to take even more uh, money away from basic lending um, into non-regulated entities. And how that so so to to say about bank balance sheets, they're more securities um, uh, interest rate. Uh, 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 variable than credit variable. And in 2007, 2008, it was a credit variable thing. The economy is just totally different because the consumers are uh, under levered. The banks are basically securities warehouses. Um, and what that means for the economy is, and I think this is an important point, um, if Basel III endgame goes through, and uh, as uh, the 16 banks are new banks are ring fences with uh, over 100 billion in, in assets, you're going to have more and more um, lending go outside of the um, the banking industry. Now, outside of the banking industry um, means that there's no Community Reinvestment Act that. Um, that uh, mandates that they have to reinvest in um, uh, uh, low-income areas or rural areas. So you're going to see uh, uh, capital come out of those areas. And that is, um, that's truly upsetting um, because you want to enable as many people to be a part of the banking system as possible. And I think that's an unintended consequence that the regulators uh, really need to think about. So do you think the proposal as it stands right now that the Fed has put forth as pertains to Basel III is a bad idea? I think it's, there's a lot that's wrong with it. And I think that for the first time in my um, professional career, the banks are going after um, uh, the regulators and saying, what are you thinking? There's no data that's so supportive of any of this. It, you know, they took a long time to do this. It seems uh, absolutely ham-fisted. And the, 
if, if they're really focused on protecting the system and protecting the U.S. consumer, this is not the way to go about it. How worried are you? You mentioned that a lot of this is going to move outside of the regulatory realm into the unregulated realm. How worried are you that that's going to create complications like we saw a la leading up to 2008 with the shadow banking system? Um, not at all, because if it goes out into, um, so uh, the, the, the banks were systemic. Um, I worked in the 90s and I covered uh, subprime finance and I remember I covered uh, uh, auto finance, subprime auto finance. I went on the Houston Loop and visited all the used car dealerships. It was very glamorous. 99% um, uh, of those companies went out of business mm -hmm. and nobody noticed. I noticed because I was in the industry. Um, uh, uh, similarly, uh, in 2005, 2006, when you know, non-regulated mortgage companies went out of business, it didn't it didn't hurt anybody because it wasn't government guaranteed. So, am I worried about it? I, you know, investors, buyer beware to the for, for those stocks. Um, but I, what I worry about specifically is access to credit for um, for uh, communities that uh, are really going to be deprived of it. I think that's what regulators should focus on. So, given your outlook for credit, what is that going to mean for the economy going forward? It means that people will pay more for credit. That's that's for certain. Um, and so it. Uh, but you're not it, forecasting a recession. You're seeing slower growth as a result. Um, I think growth has already started to slow. I think that uh, uh, various industries have gone through sort of a rolling industry um, uh, recession. The consumer has not. But the consumer is um, is doesn't have sort of the the post COVID. Let's go out and party, you know, and and buy as much stuff as as we can. They're tempering it, but they still have um, they still have money to spend. I would also point out that, um, you know, I go to the Church of Walmart, where what they say is what I believe, and um, they said in in August September, if uh, if they see a very strong back to school season, um, they'll see a very strong ha uh, Halloween season and a very strong Christmas season, and that's what they saw. So I'm gonna. Um, I, I take a lot, put, put a lot of stock in that. All right. Well, the economy keeps on ticking. Uh, switching gears, I always like to shine a light on women in the economy. And you, as a woman, have worked on Wall Street for years. Uh, first in an investment bank, now you're back with your own advisory firm. How did you see Wall Street handling the gender pay gap? I mean, women are still making 83 cents on the dollar versus men. And these are women who have full-time jobs. How do you think we should go about closing the gender pay gap? I don't know that that gap is, is that a, a Wall Street gap or a national gap? National. Yeah, so um, I hit the jackpot when I started on Wall Street in that um, I, I landed in research it was the greatest job that I ever Im imagined. Um, I worked, you know, like Mike Bloomberg says, you, you're probably smarter than me, but I'll outwork you every day. I, I worked because I knew I was a history major in, in college. What did I know about? I assumed everybody was smarter than me. I still do. Um, and so I just worked really hard. I never had an issue with pay. I could have, been, you know, it's Wall Street is a meritocracy, and that's all I've ever known. Now, you cannot like the lifestyle, um, but uh, if you deliver and you work really hard and you have a product that sells, you'll get paid. Um, and I thought that that was very fair. So I got very lucky um, actually getting into Wall Street when I did. And other industries aren't, this, uh, aren't uh, may not be the same, and certainly that has to change. You know, one thing that um, hap you know, certainly happened um, when I started, I had a bunch of uh, women with me when I started, and they left the industry because they didn't like the lifestyle. I never left the industry because I loved I loved the content, and I loved learning, and it was amazing. Um, and I also think that what you learn on, on Wall Street, working as intensely as you do, you can take to any other industry, and your work ethic and approach, it will differentiate you. So, so I, have, um, I have only a gratitude for Wall Street. So what's your advice to younger women who are trying to climb the career ladder now? Um, I would say don't keep asking the questions about work-life balance. There's work and there's life. And choose, right? So in your in your when you start out, you have this unbelievable 
opportunity to learn and get everything, um, absorb everything, and it, it, you know, it, it, you can work, you're never gonna learn as much at that point, and you're never gonna have as much mentorship at that point in terms of um, 360 mentorship and have people um, work next to you that you can learn from. It's really extraordinary. So um, just appreciate the opportunity that you have and take it all in and work really hard and differentiate yourself and find something you love because what I do today does not feel like work. I still feel like I hit the jackpot. All right, well, Meredith Whitney, thank you so much for your insight. I so appreciate it. Great to have you here. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.